Hello and welcome to History by the Pint, a new podcast that covers all things history and archaeology in the time it takes to drink a pint. My name is Alex Rosen, I'm a TV producer and author, and with me is Glyn Davis, a curator at Colchester Castle Museum, and Chris Shevitsky, a lecturer and researcher in Rome. Now, we originally studied together at the British School in Rome, way back in 2007, and since then we've been regularly meeting up for a pint and to chat about what we've been working on and the latest news in the world of history and archaeology. That habit has now evolved into this podcast series. This time around, I'm going to be sharing my memories about filming the discovery of Richard III. So do you guys hear about this film called The Lost King that came out in 2022 and released on DVD this year, 2023? Yeah, I did. Did you, Chris? Well, I I got caught up in the controversy of it all. Ah. My mum saw it. She, she, She really liked it. So oh, did she? I, I haven't good. seen it, but my mum really liked it. Yeah, and she's the litmus test for these things. So <laughs> that's exactly. exactly the target audience. Yeah, um, it mainly got a lot of press because, like Glenn said, there was this controversy about uh, when it came out because the story is told from the perspective of Philippa Langley, who, who's the main person involved with setting up the dig and and had a major major role to play in finding the body of Richard the Third. But it was quite interesting because it, the press was all about really Philippa feeling alienated by the university who she worked with and her feeling that she'd been sort of pushed aside in a way and there was this huge backlash from the university and that's what made the press and part of it was because I think Steve Coogan's company who was making the the film sort of you know branded it as the amateur versus the establishment you know an under underdog hero type story which is quite interesting and and my experience with this is that I was lucky enough to actually film the Richard III dig from the beginning to pretty much the ending when, when they, they announced it is, is that it, it was his body in, in February 2013, I think it was. The dig was in 2012. So it was quite interesting, really, because I definitely felt that there was a little bit of, of that, of, of you know, academia on one side and, and Philippa and, and the Ricardians, the amateurs on the other side. But again, I thought that's sort of expected, though, I, I, I thought, because it's such a big discovery that it was inevitable that the university were going to try and ring it for all it's worth. And so I went, when I went to look at the film, I obviously had that in my mind. And I just sort of wonder, actually, if, if really it's been sort of pl- amped up a little bit too much. And I think partly the reason for that is that the film basically has the discovery of Richard as a, as a fait complete. We have Philippa encountering the, the car park where there's this R written on the, the tarmac of the car park, of course, for reserved. But she gets a very, very strong feeling that actually was for Richard III, which she got back, you know, in 2004, 2005. And from that point on, she started to build the the project and eventually, you know, broke ground in, in August 2012. And the film very much follows that line, but it follows the line so much that you lose all the jeopardy of the archaeological dig, because of course, <laughs> Philippa might have felt that there was a body under the R, of which there was, uh, which was found within the first 10 minutes of the dig, uh, which from our filming point of view was great because we we thought we were going to film absolutely nothing. So we were cock hoop with that. But <laughs> with the film, it was like, oh, right, it's definitely him. They found him and that's that. So I get the feeling in the third act, there was no real payoff. So I get the feeling that they then probably had to amp up this this rivalry or this controversy between the University of, of Leicester, who were a major stakeholder in the dig and obviously, you know, supplied all the experts and took a lot of credit for doing that, rightly so, and Philippa, who felt that she was sidelined. I think there is a bit of truth there, but I don't know. To me, it just seems like it was maybe exaggerated a bit more purely for a dramatic effect. I haven't seen the film, so I can't comment on what happens in the third act, but in terms of pressures from university or universities trying to claim credit. I mean, you say university as if it's one coherent, cohesive body. A university is full of competing interests. And what perhaps members of staff within an archaeological department do or wish to promote is quite different to then what the vice chancellor of a university or the uh, media relations with a university do. And so again, it's I haven't seen the film, so I can't comment on who is singled out or, or picked up in terms of staff. But You know, a university wants its research to come to the fore. That's absolutely correct. The way in which that research can come to the fore is not necessarily the way in which the researchers themselves would have packaged it or presented it 
who, you know, speaking in general terms, tend to perhaps be a little bit more modest. But for a university point of view, you know, if they've found something what they consider important, and then it's moving out of the hands of the experts who are working in archaeology or in, in the particular fields. And this is true for the sciences as well. And it moves into the the media relations areas of the university who want who put stories out into the um, put it out on the wire, goes into the press, see where it gets picked up or not. But the way in which that's packaged and and presented can perhaps be quite different from the way in which uh, the actual researchers themselves would have presented it. I'm not saying that's the case here, but the idea that the university versus the amateur, well, the university in itself is is an enormous organisation with lots of competing interests within that. I did read a a lot about it. And what interested me, I suppose, in, in reading about the controversy and what, what lay at the heart and what's being represented is there's always two sides to an argument, aren't there? There are, there are different stories around this. And I, I wonder, you know, as you say, to make a good film, you take it in a certain direction. I just wonder if the the due diligence was done because, of course, the individual, the academic and archaeologist at the centre, you know, was... I don't know. I, I don't know if they just t- took an assumption. You was, used the word assumption, I think, of you know, all these archaeologists and, and, and painted them as people from the 50s. And it's like, well, we're, <laughs> the profession is not like that. Yeah. And I yeah, probably yeah. agree. I imagine they, they should have done They should have done more. I mean, archaeology, professional archaeology in general, I think, has to really engage with the public. And this is an instance where you're engaging with an in- individual, but this this person, this story, and everything around it is more than that. It, it belongs. It's it's everyone's. It belongs to everyone, doesn't it? Although everyone's not digging it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely felt that at the time because the the actual dig was it was undertaken by by ULAS, the University of Leicester Archaeological Service, which are an independent unit essentially that now operates out of you know the campus and and have some cooperation with the university, but they are an independent company they have to you know earn their own money and all the rest of it and for them it was a contract job and they were very willing to indulge Philippa and some of her ideas and for them it was a great opportunity to investigate the medieval landscape of Leicester which of course you know no one knows it better so for them it was the opportunity to fill in a blank space and they were obviously massively interested in it but to me it always felt like you know they they were there to do their job and, and to do it the best abilities and then you had Philippa who actually was there to find Richard III and then the experts that came later, a lot of those people were from Leicester University and they tried to, you know, show off their full panoply of, of techniques and experts and stuff. And, and therefore you had a different, there was definitely a sea change in attitude I felt between, you know, these two fantastic or three weeks digging in this car park. It was just us and the archaeologists, great relationship. Everyone was very, very happy. And then as soon as that discovery hit, you literally felt it when you, when they actually announced the findings uh, straight away after the body was found and the dig ended saying, you know, by the way, guys, the dig's finished and we found a guy, you know, with curvature of the spine with war wounds and he's buried in the centre of the church. It's like, uh, really? You know, it was a bit of a, oh my God moment. But it was also <laughs> a moment when I think one side of the project fell away and another one began. And and you know, like I said, ULAS continued their their work writing it up and doing the research, but then the other experts took it on and and perhaps it was sort of um, became more of a, a University of Leicester project than it had been previously. But but again, you know, this stuff is not cheap and they did foot the bill for it. Um, <laughs> so I don't really blame them for it. Yeah, who, fund, who, fund, who funded it? It was the University of Leicester. Well, the, the actual dig at the beginning, the I mean, again... Leicester funded it. Well, they partly funded it. I mean, Philippa Langley was trying to raise money for for a long, long time, the Looking for Richard project. And, and she got a lot of donations from crowdsourcing from Ricardians, members of, of the Richard III Society, and the, uh, the, the Council of Leicester were on board, and of course, Leicester University were on board. And that all played into getting the, the, the GPR survey done of the car park and the excavation for, for two, three weeks. But then, you know, that was, that's where the money ended. So I think when Richard's body was found, I think the university then did take on a lot of the the costs for everything else. Uh, you know, obviously it was in their interest to do that as well. And, 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 and perhaps that that's why it's, it's, I can understand the university being sort of slightly dissatisfied with what Steve Coogan's film is sort of doing and painting them as the villains when actually, you know, they did a lot of the legwork there. It's a bizarre thing to paint anyone as, as villains, from this. Yeah. It's an archaeological dig, and yeah, you, you know, always maybe, need a good maybe, villain. Maybe Chris. from the you need a good villain. Century and, uh, 
Early twentieth century, there's yeah. a few villains. Well, um, the guy, the guy Richard Taylor caught the flack, who was the the comms officer, and and he did have a very difficult job because he was. I mean, there was sort of a myriad of problems with the trying to reconcile Philippa's wants of the project and theirs was quite difficult. And, and we, as a documentary team, were in the middle of that. You know, Philippa wanted the project done in, in certain ways and wanted the bones respected in certain ways. And the university obviously wanted to show off their academic qualifications where it's all very cut and dry. And, and there's a different language, I think, between them. What's interesting f- from my hindsight is that I- I've always been quite protective over the memories that I have of that dig. I remember certain bits very, very well. I remember the way the dig unfolded. You know, it was like the dream dig where we thought nothing would be found and yet. The first couple of trenches, you know, we hit archaeology over the course of a week. Parts of this this friary were discovered. They they were able to all orientate. I, want, I, I wanted then, to ask you. Know, you mm. I wanted to ask you about this actually, Alex, because you know, from an emotional perspective of you going along, because firstly. This must be very rare. I can't think of another instance where you you, you go looking. One aspect, you could call it treasure hunting if you're looking for a, a thing. This, of course, is a is a person, an individual, a king. I think in terms of British archaeology, that that's quite unique where you, and indeed an independent person, if you like, you use the word amateur, but they're, they're independent of any organisation in some ways, professional organisations doing the archaeology, goes, you, you know, is doing that research and, and, and you know, making this project happening, getting it off the ground. And I just wondered, you know, at what point when you engaged with this project, did you suddenly go, oh, blimey, I think they might actually... I mean, you said this earlier and you've done, you, I know you used to work for Time Team and we all know a good Time Team episode sometimes ended with nothing. I mean, lots of them and they made a good story out of it. But I wondered, at what point did you suddenly, did it just switch for you and you went, wow, no, this this is making sense and this is, yeah, really, there may be something here. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one because when I joined the project, I was definitely, my perspective was coloured by the, yeah, like you said, no one goes find, you know, looking for a king and finds him. So, we, as a TV crew, had two weeks, essentially, to make a pilot. And the main driver for the pilot, you mentioned Time Team. Time Team was coming to an end that year, being cancelled by Channel 4. Channel 4 were on the lookout for the next big history series. They really liked Simon Farnaby, who is a, a horrible histories actor. And so they said, Darlow Smithson Productions, DSP, with the company that were pitching the idea, and they'd been following this idea of Richard III, and they thought, well, hang on a minute, let's try and kill two birds with one stone, let's make a pilot programme with Simon Farnaby, see if she, he wants to be a presenter, see, see how, how he's like in that role, and let's do some filming of this dig. And they said the dig was very much like a background to this test pilot with, with Simon Farnaby. And so we went into it thinking, right, well, we need to have loads of stuff to, to film because we're not going to find anything in this car park. Therefore, we set up, you know, trips to Bosworth. We did, you know, going to do loads of Shakespeare's Richard III, loads on Leicester history, just to fill up the time because we thought there is going to be nothing in this car park to film. <laughs> so we went in there thinking, if we can get anything, we're happy. So they hit a, a body pretty much straight into the dig. And we thought, thank God, that's great. Now we've essentially got something. As soon as you have a body, it doesn't matter who it is, you, you can extend the story. Uh, and that's what we yeah. thought. Um, but the body was left where it was. Uh, it, and, and the you know, the trenches were extended and, 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 and excavated. It started to become interesting. You know, the finds are quite small. They had some nice pottery. You know, again, any finds were, were great. We realised they had, had more, uh, more for the story. Uh, they hit the uh, part of the chapter house and, and the cloister walk, which is very interesting. There was this great moment when actually in, in trench one, there was this huge, great sort of uh, robber trench that had been sort of filled with loads and loads of big stones. And that was a real effort to clear out those stones. But when they did, it became obvious that that probably was one of the sides and buttresses of the church. And then as soon as they had the church, it was like, wow, okay, this is way beyond anything we thought. So they, they did a bit more digging and, the plot or the dig was essentially two sides, two different car parks with with a wall in the middle. The main social services car park where where the two original trench trenches were, and then they put another trench over the wall to pick up where the church was. And when those trenches went in for the church, it was really really exciting because we had grave cuts. Not only that, we had one grave that actually had a a very nice stone sarcophagus with, with a lead lining, and we could tell by the metal detector lead, lead lining. But finding the church and these grave cuts completely zeroed in our attention on those grave cuts because they were, you know, in front of the altar, a really, really important part of the church for, for 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 high status or important burials. We actually had a list of who was buried in the church as well, all quite 
earlier burials, that, you know, about a century earlier than Richard. Uh, so we had actual names to look for as well. And we were all focused there. Meanwhile, the first body we'd found on the other side of the wall, you know, Philippa was really, really keen to get that excavated. So was uh, the director, Pete Woods, I work with, because it was the first body we found. He wanted to follow the storyline. So we were like, let's just go with this guy. Uh, and so they started excavating that and we left them alone, really. And we sort of checked in with, with Joe Appleby, the osteologist, and, and uh, you know, she cleared away. Uh, she obviously had the, the legs first and she went to clear away the rest of the 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 skeleton in the in the grave uh she was using a mattock and she hit the skull uh but she didn't think it was the skull that was related to the the body with the the legs she thought it might be a charnel pit or a second burial because the skull was a long way above where the legs were and so we thought okay this burial might have been disturbed a lot that, that's sort of less interesting and then we all went back to trench three then she basically stuck her head up over the wall and sort of called me over and said you guys got to come and see this as i Okay, well, we're filming an important scene here with Simon. We only had Simon in front of it for two days, right? Just turned out that he was there for the two days. <laughs> yeah. We found but that was the other thing. Uh, and she goes, "You might want to come and see this burial." I was like, "Okay, well, why?" He goes, "Well, he's got a hunchback." I was like, oh, that, "That can't be right. That sounds like a joke or something." But that was the moment for me where it's like, actually, hang on a minute. Before I even saw it, I was like, "What does even a hunchback even look like in the grave?" I had no idea. Uh, so we went round there and the curvature of the spine is like a question mark. I mean, it's, it is so obvious and, and that I've never been so nervous in my life having to set up a scene because Philippa hadn't seen, Philippa had been there when we'd excavate the head and seen that sort of thing, but she hadn't revisited the, the grave because she was convinced that the grave had been disturbed. It wasn't Richard III, like short, the, she thought he was. So she was sort of recovering from that. So we sort of set up the scene and got her around with Simon Farnaby and Simon was like, uh, look, you know, look in that trench uh, and she was absolutely devastated because it was like you know if this is Richard he had curvature of the spine and we know that Shakespeare plays on the riff that he's you know a hunchback guy with a withered hand you know sort of the embodiment of of um, medieval evil as, as it were and she was devastated by that and and was, there's just this great moment where Joe is sort of talking through the finds and and Looking at the skull again, what was really interesting is that it had clear battle wounds. That the back of the head was pretty much sliced off. There was a, another very severe puncture wound on the top of the skull. Not only that, but you know his hands were sort of looked like they were they were bound, you know, in front, and the grave was too small for him. It was sort of propped up. Although we realised that sort of later, not at the time, but it just seemed to us at, the, at that moment that we got an exceptionally important burial with curvature of the spine with battle wounds. And then it turned out because we had excavated so much of the church, they worked out that actually it probably was in the choir, you know, the central place of honour for a burial and stuff. And it was like, oh, my God. Until that moment, we were just sort of following it. And I never really thought that we'd ever find him. I was just really enjoying the process of, of the work because it was just great to to see the revelations coming in a very, very methodical and, and, and just great way for the narrative. But it wasn't until looking down, I guess, at that body where we thought, oh, my God, OK, th this actually might be be him uh and it's yeah a moment i'll never forget i think but then this this is maybe where uh in some ways this isn't a story about medieval kings right we know richard the third died in terms of what we've learned about him uh, you know we it doesn't change presumably hugely the chronicle of his reign or our understanding of england at that point this is a personal story about people's search for him but also it's a story about 21st century britain and an obsession like this is just you know i remember the media coverage of which city is he going to be buried in? is he going to be buried in leicester or york and this isn't actually and so i completely understand you know as a re researchers and archaeologists are not going to be asking questions about let's look for a specific individual because that isn't what you what you know, you're not going to get research money to go look for an individual, this isn't the time of Howard Carter and Tutankhamun. Researchers are trying to understand broader questions about society, politics, culture in particular periods of history and not look for individuals. Doesn't mean that the discovery isn't exciting, but the question is what does it actually add to our knowledge other than we found a curiosity? But I think with Richard III, what it did tell us is that there were reasons that this, this Shakespearean caricature emerged he wasn't a hunchback he he had scoliosis but it was a a tangible thing to embellish which wasn't really known before i think and and also the fact that he's the last king to die in battle and you get this incredibly vivid insight into these last moments on the battlefield where he has the back of his head chopped off 
the fact that he's put over a horse and there's loads of post-mortem uh, wounds as well. So you can imagine him being taken through the streets of Leicester, you know, and people actually flogging him or going up and some guy takes out a knife and sort of stabs him in the arse, you know, and then he's, he's put on display and then left. And then what seems to be is that the grave friars took him and then put him pretty hastily into this grave that was too small for him. So you're getting these, you're getting this narrative where we didn't really, the details there that we didn't have before. And that's what I'm quite interested in, the archaeology adding those details. What has been quite interesting, I think, with the discovery of Richard III, it's, it's a great showcase for like the power of archaeology, really, because it's done so much for Leicester. Uh, not only the reputation and 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 everything else at the university, but the actual, you know, city has has, has gained a lot. There's a now a, a new Richard the Third visitor centre. There's Richard the Third tours. There's just this huge flood of interest into this, and this is having you know tangible and beneficial results. I think so. It's a great showcase for the power of archaeology and and what it can do to really, you know, stimulate what was quite a sort of down at heel place because you know. I mean, at the time, Leicester football team weren't doing very well. <laughs> I mean, the rugby team was all right, but Leicester wasn't really on everyone's list uh, of, you know, historic towns and cities to, to have a look at. So it's been have very you interesting. you just slagged off the whole of Leicester? No, I haven't slagged it off at all. I enjoyed Leicester very much. I had a great time there. Uh, and I haven't been back there since, though, unfortunately. <laughs> it's got a great bit of Roman wall there. Oh, though, oh yeah. right. Uh, uh, we okay. talk about that all the time. But, uh, yeah, so it has just been this fantastic case study. And somewhere in the future, there will be more searches for kings and queens i doubt any of them will ever come off but you know as a vehicle for sort of promoting local heritage it's 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 not a bad uh not a bad approach i think anyway that's probably about en enough from me guys we've probably finished our pints now haven't we as always been a pleasure to chat to you and uh yeah we'll catch up next time see you later cheers cheers, cheers.